Good morning. Good to see you today as we continue in our study of Job. Uh, we are this week going to be in chapter 19, although I do want to look uh, at chapter 18 just to kind of bring us into context of what we're discussing today. This is the second speech cycle, and one of the things that's interesting about this is that Job's comforters uh, talk about God, but they don't talk with God. Job is the only character in this book of Job that speaks with God. And so as we look in chapter 18 today, as we begin this uh, second uh, speech cycle, Bildad is speaking. And Bildad is very critical, rather than comforting, of Job. Uh, Bildad believes that, that Job is self-centered, is egotistical, he believes he's too emotional, and he is, is criticizing him uh, through this entire thing. And Bildad also believes that one's sins are accounted for during that person's lifetime. So Bildad is convinced that Job's current sins against God are the reason for his suffering. And in verse 1 of chapter 18, we read that, Then Bildad the Shumite replied, When will you end these speeches? Be sensible, and then we can talk. Why are we regarded as cattle and considered stupid in your sight? For you tear yourself to pieces in your anger. Is the earth to be abandoned for your sake? Or must the rocks be moved from their places? In other words, Bildad is saying to Job, are you so self-centered, so egotistical, that you believe that the national landscape, the earth, the landscape uh, must be changed for you. And in verse 9, he says, A trap seizes him by the heel, a snare holds him fast, a noose is hidden for him on the ground. A trap lies in his path. So this is the person who is supposed to be comforting Job. But what they're doing is just hurling insults and, and derogatory speeches against each other. In verse 21, Surely such is the dwelling of an evil man, such is the place of one who knows not God. So Bildad, at this point, has accused Job of not knowing God of not being acquainted with God, of not being a faithful uh, person of God, uh, cruel and insensitive rather than being helpful. And then if we begin in, in chapter 19, and Job is now replying to what Bildad has said. And as you recall, the pattern is one of the so-called comforters will speak, uh, Job will reply, then another comforter will speak, and Job will reply again, uh, losing the, using the term comforter uh, very loosely. But in chapter 19, verse 1, Job replied, How long will you torment me and crush me with your words? Ten times now you have reproached me shamelessly, you attack me. So Job is impatient um, with their attacks and their superior attitude. In verse 4, if it is true that I have gone astray, my error remains my concern alone. In other words, if, I've, if I have sinned in front of God, then that's between me and God. This is my concern alone and it's not yours, Bildad, so back off. In verse 5, If indeed you would exalt yourselves above me and use my humiliation against me, 
to know that God has wronged me and drawn his net around me. So dragging Job down, they believe, to lift themselves up, to humiliate Job, to accuse him of all manner of wrongdoing that they allege that he has done uh, and thus deserves the punishment that God has allowed him to have. And once again, Job is not aware of the divine counsel. He's not aware of his deal with Satan to inflict or to allow the, the troubles that Job is experiencing. Uh, Satan, by God's permission, has done these things, but, but of course Job does not know that. And then in verse 15, uh, Job continues by saying, My guests and my maidens, maidservants can count me a stranger. They look upon me as an alien. I summon my servant, but he does not answer, though I beg him with my own mouth. In verse 17, my breath is offensive to my wife. I am loathsome to my own brothers. Even the little boys scorn me. When I appear, they ridicule me. So you can see that because of the, the humiliation and the, the depth of the criticism that his comforters have given, you can see that, that Job's uh, grip on his confidence, uh, his self-esteem uh, is rapidly deteriorating. Uh, even to say that, that his wife, uh, in his present state, the only thing that he has left, uh, she says, he says, my breath is offensive to my wife. Uh, what a terrible position to be in, to be completely alone now. And then in verse 19, uh, he says, all my intimate friends detest me, those I love have turned against me. I am nothing but skin and bones and have escaped with only the skin of my teeth. Uh, commentaries vary on this. Uh, most uh, believe that the only thing that Job had left were his gums, that his, his uh, uh, teeth had all fallen out. Uh, some believe that, that uh, the skin of his teeth uh, as it is now was just a saying and that, uh, that he did have his, have his teeth. I have escaped with only the skin of my teeth. Have pity on me, my friends, have pity. For the hand of God has struck me. Now, it's interesting that Job, even now under this uh, deluge of criticism, now asks his friends. He still calls them friends and says, have pity on me. And, and right here we see Job at a low point in this conversation in his life. Everything is gone. His wife has repulsed him. His, you know, his teeth are gone, and he is at a low point. But the tide turns. And in verse 22, Job seems to be making a comeback. He seems to be uh, recovering and and in all of this suffering and all of this, the trials that he's going through, Job continues to be faithful to God. He does not give up on God. He says, this is my fault and God has wronged me or God is punishing me, but it's between God and myself and he has not lost his faith. And in verse 22, it, it reads, Why do you pursue me as God does? Will you never get enough of my flesh? So these three comforters uh, are doing just the opposite of what they should be doing. Rather than lifting Job up and trying to help him in 
his time of trial. He is being criticized. They're giving him bad advice. They're accusing him of things that he did not do, all in the name of comforting Job. And he says in verse 23, and this is a, it is, it is a truth now that we see. Oh, that my words were recorded, that they were written on a scroll, that they were inscribed with an iron tool on lead or engraved in rock forever. And of course, we know that came to pass because we're studying Job's word today. It also is a reminder of the book of life that we find in Revelation uh, in the third chapter, and I believe the fifth verse. So Job is wanting to preserve his words for pros posterity's sake. Oh, if my words were recorded that they were written on a scroll. And then in verse 25, and this is probably the most um, popular, the most well-known verse in Job or verses in Job that have been uh, captured by Christians uh, for years as, as indication of the coming Messiah. And Job says, here, I know, in, in verse 25, I know that my Redeemer lives and that in the end he will stand upon the earth. I know that my Redeemer lives. Now, what is the, the form of that Redeemer? Of course, Christians claim that to be a sign of a coming Messiah. But the idea of Redeemer is not a new concept here in Job. It went back as far as Leviticus, uh, then uh, with Boaz and Ruth, uh, where Boaz was a kinsman Redeemer. There were Redeemers of property. But this is not a new concept, but the way that Job words this, I know that my Redeemer lives and that in the end he will stand upon the earth. And I visualize a, a mighty Redeemer standing uh, in, in presence and in control and redeeming Job. Verse 26 says, And after my skin has been destroyed, Yet in my flesh, I will see God. I myself will see him with my own eyes. I am not another. So the question comes then, when will this happen? Uh, Job is now at a point where he certainly believes that his uh, physical deterioration will lead to his death. When does he plan to see his Redeemer, and in what form will that be? Uh, certainly, I wouldn't say a fully resurrected body, but clearly Job believes that he will have uh, physical properties that he will see his Redeemer with his own eyes, not anyone else's, but my own eyes. Uh, he uh, feels, it seems, that he will have some flesh and bone structure. But I myself, with my own eyes and not another, how my heart yearns within me. And when I read that line, I think about the story of the walk to Emmaus where the two disciples were walking along and Jesus appeared to them. And it, the scripture tells us that their heart burned within them when Jesus revealed the word of scripture to them. And I think that that is very similar to the 
experience that Job is having at this time. How my heart yearns within me for for God to be in his presence, to be restored in his relationship to God. All of us have a yearning in our heart, a an empty place in our heart that only God can fill. Uh, we try to stuff other things in it, uh, material things, but only God fulfills the needs of our heart. And Job says, how my heart yearns within me. The disciples said, our heart burns when Jesus revealed the scriptures to us. We were made in God's image to be with him, to relate to him. And that is what Job is saying. In verse 28, it says, If you say, How will we will hound him, since the root of the trouble lies in him? Uh, here is where Job is getting right testy and, and pushing back. You should fear the sword yourselves, for wrath will bring punishment by the sword. If we look at Matthew, if we look in the, the seventh chapter of Matthew, verses one and two, it says, do not judge or you too will be judged. For in the same way you judge others, you will be judged. And with the measure you use, it will be measured to you. Job is saying in his words at this time, be careful how you judge me. For if you are wrong, punishment will bring wrath by the sword to you. You should fear the sword yourself, for wrath will bring punishment by the sword. And then the last part of that uh, section, and then you will know that there is judgment. Job, even at this point, after the, the verbal stoning by Bildad and his colleagues, uh, the abuse that has been uh, poured upon Job, and the severe physical uh, trauma that he's going through, the loss of his teeth, the deterioration of his body, just skin and bones and open sores. And on top of that, the, the mental uh, trials of losing uh, his wealth, losing his family, being left completely alone. Yet, he did not blame God for these trials and tribulations, yet praised him and stood with him. What a guy. Let's pray together. Father, we adore you today. We thank you for your word that allows us to study and gain some insight into Job's life and Job's thinking. Father, we thank you for Jesus. We thank you that you loved us so much that you sent your son to die for us that we might have eternal life. Uh, Father, life is full of trials and tribulations. Job gave us that example. We know that. But superseding all of that, above all of the trials and tribulations, God loves us. God is with us, and God will save us. Uh, Father, as we uh, come today, we lift up those that, that are ill or uh, suffering physically uh, in the hospital, uh, people that are separated from families. Uh, Father, we just pray your comfort upon them, your real presence 
with them and in their lives. Father, we pray that you would be with our church, that, that you would bless it and use it to share the good news to the people that don't know you, to the lost groups of people that have never had the privilege of, of seeing and experiencing the love of Jesus. Father, we thank you. We give you the glory. And we look forward to the continued study of your word. And it is in the mighty name of Jesus that we pray. And all God's children said, Amen. God bless you.